All right, everyone. It is now two minutes past from our start time, and we can go ahead and get started. So welcome. I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Her name is Antika Kalina, who is from the Institute of Roder Boscovic. Did I pronounce that correct? I probably butchered Almost. it. <laughs> Almost. What is the, what is the uh, correct way to pronounce that? Um, so Antica Trulina, that's my name and surname, and Institute Ruger Boscovic. But I understand it's quite difficult. It's Croatian language, so fine. <laughs> well, thank you for understanding. I appreciate that. And she will be speaking on how can open science reduce research waste across fields. So with that, go ahead and take it away. Okay, um, share. Uh, I believe you see my screen and the slideshow. We you are. Do? We're seeing um, okay. PowerPoint. Okay. There you then are. I'll start. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this was actually meant to be a workshop. Uh, we already whole, held two such workshops, but for the conference, it was promoted or demoted or whatever to, to a 10 minutes talk. So I'll still try to a bit keep off the structure as it was a workshop because the aim is also to get some input from um, research across the fields. Um, and to start with, I would like to first introduce this concept of research waste. Um, and for that, well, obviously, thinking about research quality has started probably at the same time as people started to conduct research. But, but for the purpose of this uh, concept of research fair uh, waste, I will start with um, editorial by uh, Doug Altman in 1994, so 30, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, he starts this editorial saying, uh, what should we think about the doctor who uses the wrong treatment, either willfully or through ignorance, uses the right treatment wrongly, uh, so we would probably find this unprofessional, unethical, and uh, unacceptable. And then he continues asking, what should we think about researchers who use the wrong technique, again, either willfully or uh, through ignorance, or the right technique wrongly, misinterpret their results, report their results selectively, cite the literature selectively, and draw unjustified conclusions. Um, so he, he thinks we should be appalled, and I agree with that. But interestingly enough, even 30 years after this editorial, um, we still have similar uh, problems in science and in research. Then in 2009, uh, Schalmers and Glassieu uh, have calculated something they called research that's avoidably wasted. And it turned out to be around 85% of medical research. So this is all research that has been funded, but does not have a value to the end users. So practitioners or uh, patients or similar. How did they calculate this value? Well, they estimated it uh, from uh, the percentage of studies that have some design flows, quite a large percentage, all the unpublished studies, obviously these are uninformative, and unusable reports. So there is a study, but you cannot use the values that are reported there. Um, and later on, they also estimated, uh, kind of put some financial value to this estimate, which was around $140 billion a year. And it's a huge sum of money. So I'm an ecologist and I was interested in, um, oh, sorry. And then later there are also some changes, um, also partly maybe uh, encouraged by this failure to replicate studies cancer research studies, and in 2014, there was this Lancet series about how to add value and avoid waste in medical research. So as ecologist, I was also interested to see uh, what is the, way, the waste that we have in ecology, and we estimated this to be between 82 and 89 percent. Um, the work was done by my master's student, Maria Burgar, and collaborator, uh, Tim Klanschek. How did we estimate this? Not completely in the same way as uh, in medicine, but we used published meta studies in ecology that have already estimated some components of research waste. And altogether, our sample was more than 10,000 studies in ecology. So what did we find? Well, around 45% of funded studies are never published. 
This can be obviously because they were low quality work and thus did not manage to get published, but also because of results they found um, and then publication bias or sometimes lack of time. Uh, out of published studies, around 67% of studies were poorly planned. For example, they had improper control group or they applied incorrect analysis or did not use blinding in data collection or data analysis. And finally, in published studies, 41% of results are underreported. So for example, they don't report a sample size they used or they don't report effect size. So um, in the best case scenario, and this is when all well-planned well work is also well-reported, uh, we have around 82% of wasted research. And in the worst case scenario, when, where all the well-planned work is badly reported, we have 89% of waste. And these are really huge numbers. And uh, I think it's even worse than this because we considered kind of classical research life cycle. Uh, so uh, have you collected data in a proper way and analyzed it? Have you published it? And have you reported your results in full? However, we have other components of research, such as uh, unpublished data, unpublished analytical codes, uh, unpublished methods. Uh, and finally, not all publications are accessible for everybody. So what we are working on currently is trying to create a more um, well, broader framework for describing this research waste that would accommodate all of these different factors, but also other fields. Because, for example, in medicine, they also looked into relevance of studies to patients, which is something that we did not take into account in ecology. So ideally, why do we have such a huge waste and why is it so similar in medicine and in ecology? And I'm really curious about other research fields, which would be great if somebody estimates this, because results are so similar, these estimates. And I think it's because researchers are embedded in the same uh, research system or ecosystem. So we have preferred research on one hand, which is robust and gives us the results that are closer to the truth. And the other hand is incentive system and support system, where we basically strive to publish as much as possible. So in order to change this overall dire situation, we have to involve all of these different components of the research ecosystem. And they all have to act together in order to reduce such a huge research waste. And we do believe that open science practices have really strong potential to reduce waste. For example, if uh, researchers provide open data in a fair format, then even if you don't publish any results from your study, this data can still be used. Or you can use open data and open code to recalculate underreported results and similar. So different types of open science practices and also those outside of open science can be used to reduce research waste. And obviously research is conducted by researchers, so these practices should also be applied by researchers. But then it's not only on researchers, obviously. And I think this was already discussed, some of these things uh, in the prior uh, part of the conference, where we actually need publishers and funders and research institutions to step up and do different uh, accommodations in order to enable researchers or kind of encourage them to do and apply these open science practices. So um, within the project EcoOpen, um, which is now more concentrated on ecology, but we want to make it broader, we are developing a framework for research waste reduction or maybe framed in a more positive way, increasing research quality and the impact of research. Within this framework, we identify different actions, for example, open data or uh, incentive changes, such as let's evaluate open data on its own, independent on the publication. Uh, then the actors, so who is responsible for the action? Is it researcher? Is it research institution? Is it a funder? Is it a publisher? And finally, and I think very importantly, is we want to gather existing, but also collect new evidence that these actions and these actors uh, applying those actions are really contributing to increasing research quality and impact. And one evidence that we just finished kind of collecting, and I'm going to present that at um, 
this forum of Stanford Meta Research Group uh, is about the evidence that pre-registration does improve research quality. Uh, so because now we are constructing this whole framework and trying to populate it, uh, we kind of call for anybody who thinks might uh, have some uh, useful input in this to get in touch. And this is my email address, so please feel free to email me. Uh, and then we can keep you updated about the project and also like um, put your inputs into developing this framework and populating the framework. And that would be all from me. Um, thank you all for uh, coming to for the talk and also to my co-authors and for my funder. Um, so yes, that's all from me. Awesome, fantastic job, thank you. If you guys have any questions or anything else like that, please put them in either the Q&A or the chat. And if we have time at the very end, we can be able to answer them. All right, we're gonna go on to our next presenter, which is Vive Hutchison from USGC. And she's gonna present on building community around the year of open science at the US Geological Survey. So with that, take it away. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Viv Hutchison. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey uh, here in the United States. Um, so I'm going to yeah, talk a little bit about what the USGS did uh, during the year of open science here in 2023. Um, so the U.S. Geological Survey is a bureau within the Department of the Interior. It provides unbiased science about natural hazards and water, energy, minerals, and other natural resources that humans rely on, sort of the health of the ecosystems and environment and the impacts of climate and land use change. And the mission is to monitor and analyze and predict current and evolving dynamics of complex human and natural earth system inter interactions to deliverable ac deliver actionable information at scale uh, to decision makers. So within the USGS, um, we've been organized around mission areas since about the year 2010. And those mission areas represent a broad sort of mission space, bringing science to bear on a wide range of environmental resource and public safety uh, issues. And then a little bit more about USGS. This is sort of a quick snapshot of USGS today. Our director, Dave Applegate, put this slide together to sort of illustrate to audiences that might be less familiar with USGS, just a few statistics that kind of give a sense of the entire uh, organization. Because um, usually people know sort of one part of USGS. Oh, I know they do earthquake studies or mapping or something like that. Um, so just a few interesting notes on this slide. We've had over 165,000 publications since USGS inception in 1879. 54,000 uh, topographic maps have been produced, 3,800 earthquake sensors are out around the world, uh, 11,500 stream gauges are out as well collecting data on water. So there's just a lot of scientific data and information being collected, analyzed, and released to the public uh, as open science. So in 2023, USGS engaged early to participate in the year of open science, um, science.gov hosted agency names who signed on to be involved in promoting open science. And so USGS was included on that list from the beginning. And we sort of posted updates um, to that site over the course of the year. Um, but USGS has really kind of a longstanding culture around open science and open data. We're always trying to actively work to enhance that culture and make it better. Uh, we lead thriving communities of practice, actually, to provide essential leadership sort of from the ground up. And that helps to promote best practices and translate our science into information that's meaningful and understandable to those who need it the most. We have a community for data integration, who alongside our recently created chief data officer position and our USGS data strategy that we wrote during 2023, um, these all sort of help us strive for innovative practices in the management, interoperability, and open delivery of our complex data sets as we strive towards advancing our open science. We have a lot of enterprise data management and release tools and applications that help ensure our scientists can manage scientific data through the life cycle. 
Um, and we've studied our success in open science in a report that we produced called the State of the Data. And we found areas where we can make improvements to our processes. And then underlying all of this, we have some policies in USGS um, that are sort of defining and guiding and documenting how we carry out and assure the highest quality impartial science is released to the public. Um, so those are kind of foundational and crucial to some of the open data and open science that we are doing. Um, there's really a lot riding on USGS science, including lives and property. And this makes sort of that balance of open and trustworthy uh, incredibly important to the Bureau. So one of the first actions we took in USGS was to initiate a working group and to ensure that we identified some key activities and kept accomplishing work related to promotion of open science. So the group was comprised of individuals with diverse expertise across USGS in scientific data management and release, communications, and scientific integrity. And we aligned our work with that of the US government's subcommittee on open science, year of open science working group as well, and what was going on in that area. So what did we work on and focus on? We really concentrated on promoting and communicating uh, best practices and training opportunities. And so I'll explain sort of in the next several um, slides what we did. So one of the first activities was design a, a website to highlight the year of open science. And we featured content, including success stories and tips for doing open science training opportunities, references to other inf informational resources, such as the USGS data management website, our software management website, and our fundamental science practices, which are our policies on data review and approval and release. Uh, and this is just sort of a closer view of a few of the success stories that were published on the website. The working group developed this form and sort of advertised it widely to USGS science teams requesting stories to include on the website. So a lot were submitted and posted to the website, and these are just a few examples. Um, and each story kind of contains details on how the researcher was using open science principles to perform their science and how these principles helped achieve their science goals. And so the stories were really diverse and interesting and showed the power of open science in our research. Another critical component here is promoting and communicating about open science for USGS uh, is provided by the Community for Data Integration. And that's a community I mentioned earlier, it's stewarding knowledge needed for working with earth science data. And it has a couple of goals. And those are to collectively grow our data expertise of our members and to facilitate communication sort of across boundaries in order to share and grow our knowledge base. And so the community is about 14 years old. It's grown to about 2,600 members and 150 people or so call into monthly calls. Um, and we have like 19 uh, subcommittees or working group collaboration areas that focus on different data topics or, term or domains. And it's completely voluntary and open and people spend their time with CDI because it really helps them advance their own work in open data and open science. Um, in May of 2023, we hosted a workshop and the Community for Data Integration um, facilitated that. It was in-person and virtual scientists and data managers and technical experts and USGS leadership uh, gathered. This was a four-day meeting and the theme was open data for open science. So um, all of these people, over 400 participants sort of led and learned from sessions about open science for decision to support and imagery as data and vocabularies for data interoperability and effectively communicating uh, open science and so forth. Um, and also in 2024, we have um, the CDI has released a request for proposals. And one of the themes in that request for proposals was increasing USGS capacity for open science. Um, so this is an annual proposal process that we have that showcases and selects ideas to solve data challenges and implement new technological innovations. Um, so this just helps improve our collective knowledge. Also want to highlight the some best practices. We had an initiative to develop a series of open science tips. Those were added monthly throughout the year and gave scientists some guidance and references on various techniques to engage in open science principles throughout the year. Um, 
We also did some communicating across USGS. Uh, what, we think one of the challenges of sort of a big federally announced focused year like this is sort of getting information and actionable thing, things down to practitioners. And so we wanted to make sure it went past the manager or director level in USGS. And so we used a variety of approaches, um, blogs and websites and community and training and so forth to communicate to those practitioners. So this was one avenue on this slide. We had three different uh, what we call leaders blog posts to sort of an internal um, uh, internal weekly kind of communication that goes out to USGS. Okay, and then a little bit of training. We have um, a, a lot of open science training and a variety of data topics as a regular ag a learning agenda for employees. And so um, we hosted also an a uh, USGS webinar open to all employees on data equity as well. And that was given by the We All Count organization. And we really learned core issues facing equitable data and how to care more about data collection, analysis, interpretation, and reporting, and sort of, you know, the bias and unfairness that might happen when communicating science through data. We also hosted a number of data carpentries trainings uh, through USGS and topics like introduction to Python and R for geospatial data. And so these are really popular courses. Over 100 people register for these courses um, and, and kind of get a lot out of it. And that helps us to um, spread the word about open science and open data and how to keep working through that. So lastly here, uh, what's next? We're gonna continue our open science endeavors. Uh, we won't stop <laughs> just because the year of 2023 is over. Uh, and we just wanna continue to perpetuate open science in USGS, communicating, promoting uh, and fostering a culture that emphasizes open data, access, equity, sharing, reproducibility, collaboration and co-production. We've come a long way over the last decade and we'll continue our efforts into the future. So thank you very much. Awesome, fantastic, thank you. All right, it looks like our third speaker from Helio Cloud is not here yet. So we're going to go ahead and move on to our fourth speaker who is Julia. She is from Openscapes and she is going to talk, uh, her presentation is NASA Openscapes Approaches and Stories of Kinder Open Science in the Cloud. So with that, Julia. Great. Hi. Um, let me just get um, situated. <clears throat> okay. Okay. I think you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm excited to chat with you today. Um, I'm going to share some stories um, about OpenScapes and thinking about open science as a movement for kinder science for future us. So, um, we are all here because open science can change the world and the skills that open science can give us can just make us feel amazing and like a superpower. I think this image really captures how um, how I feel about open science and how I've seen folks talk about open science at this conference um, so far. However, there are challenges um, with open science and something that has been um, uh, throughout our work through open science is is time. It takes real time to learn skills to participate in open science, to practice open science, and to teach others open science. Um, and also having mindsets around open science is another challenge, both for individuals about whether um, you're a coder or a data person, whether you're an expert to teach other folks, um, whether you um, have agency to, to practice open science. So these are real barriers that, um, that exist and something that we at OpenScapes have really thought about 
deeply as we help folks transition to open science. So with OpenScapes, we really focus on teams and movement building and thinking about where, um, you know, where folks are able to, um, to shift time to open science and feel empowered by that. So OpenScapes is an approach and a movement. Uh, we shift culture by helping researchers move from lonely science um, towards open science as they explore and navigate this beautiful landscape of open science safely with their teams. So we really do think about open science as a, a rich landscape full of data and tools and communities and practices. And we really focus on meeting folks at the trailhead and welcoming them to this whole landscape together with teams so that they can safely navigate existing paths um, and quickly help others navigate those paths or create new paths together. Um, but this feeling of, um, of sort of loneliness or, or isolation in the bottom left corner in this image is real. Um, and so it's really about not only meeting them at the trailhead, but finding them where they are and, and welcoming them to this trailhead together. So our, um, with OpenScapes, uh, our main activity, our, our flagship program is called the Champions Program. This is a mentorship program uh, that provides open data science, technical and collaborative skill building for science teams. And since, um, since 2019, we've led this um, program um, 20 times uh, with 130, 130 teams that have worked with us. Uh, we've worked with NOAA, with the EPA, with academic groups, and just learned a ton through, um, through working with these groups to improve the program for others. It's really not a traditional training or workshop. It's remote by design. Um, teams bring the problems that they are working on and that's what their focus is through this program. And they really learn together to get unstuck. Um, the focus about teams is, um, is that it, the composition of teams can really be however, um, however folks are working, whether they have a shared project or not, whether they're faculty and students um, and techs, or whether they're admin, IT managers um, or researchers. The idea is that we all have something to learn and, and contribute around open science and data science. And even if we have different responsibilities for the work that we do or how we show up in this, um, in this work, knowing what other folks are doing and having a shared um, vision of what this could be is really important. So this is our flagship program. Um, and it's one of several initiatives that we lead um, at this point. So we are really focused on supporting researchers and those who support research. And so all of our initiatives are around open data science mentorship that really builds technical and collaborative skills for teams and for organizations. Um, so the Champions Program is the one I just mentioned that is for teams over 10 months. Our Reflections Program is a lighter weight way to start thinking about what your workflow is and reflect on what could be improved. So thinking about that first places, this first places where you're stuck and moving forward. Um, the Pathways to Open Science Program is a community building program for black marine scientists and marine researchers led by Ileana Fenwick. And we also have a mentors framework that's really built from that idea of the champions program, helping teams shift um, their work from something where they're stuck to something that they, that they um, need to advance. Um, so I'll be talking about the mentors framework um, in a moment about our work with NASA and shifting uh, practices towards cloud computing and NASA Earth data on the cloud. Um, and finally, an another initiative that's worth mentioning um, here is, is open documentation. Openness has been a uh, foundation of uh, OpenScapes from the beginning and really how we work, um, facilitation approaches, templates, code, um, slides, blogs, stories, all these things are available for reuse. And it's amazing to see how the groups we work with um, leverage these stories and templates and techniques and really improve them and apply them to their work. Um, so that's been a really exciting part of, of open science. Um, 
to make a little more concrete, some of the things we talk about and teach through OpenScapes is a growth mindset. So we focus on really concepts and tools to help reimagine scientific workflows. Um, this image in the top left completely changed my life as a research scientist. Um, I'm a marine ecologist. That's something I didn't I didn't start off with. Um, but really the idea that no matter what your study system, no matter what your data or your question, if you're working with data, you will go through a process working with data where you'll need to import those data onto your onto your computer, some kind of analytical software. And then if you take the time to tidy those data first as a first step, then you can go into this cycle of understanding and doing your science, but really recognizing that that data tidying is separate, um, that changing the date formats or renaming columns is not part of your science. So separating that will then let you reuse different tools and um, and reuse your own questions and science and code and collaborate with people. So that sort of concept is something that we talk about quite a bit in OpenScapes. We also talk about cool tools like Quarto and GitHub for open documentation, for project management, for publishing, for and for reproducible, shareable science um, that is, um, is backed by version control and, uh, and executable code. Um, another part we talk about with growth mindset is that mentorship is a skill we can all develop. Um, this growth mindset really means that we can learn from and join existing efforts and that science does not work in isolation. So skills that we develop um, through these programs is around generosity, learning how to ask questions and speak up to ask questions, listening, meeting folks where they are, reflecting and learning. We're really inspired by a lot of different movements um, in, in the, you know, that we, that we see, that we hear, that we read, that we join. And I think that, you know, we're stronger together and, and open science is certainly part of, of advancing many, many different things in, in, the, in the world. I mentioned open documentation that helps us save time. Um, Onboarding has been a real theme around open science and documentation. So when you, you know, go to Slack or email a person with to, tell, to share with them how to do something, what if that was actually in an onboarding document, document somewhere so that everyone can benefit from that and that will save us all time. So for, um, we have several different places for documentation. We think about this the way we think about code and the way you write code modularly and packages that can call each other and, and leverage each other rather than having things live in different places. So this is an example where we have a project website um, where we um, that has an audience for NASA leadership to welcome folks to join one of our programs. And then the Earth Data Cloud cookbook that the NASA community is developing also, fo uh, also focuses on onboarding folks to the tech and communication structure to contribute. And then the, uh, our approach guide really shares how we work as the, as the OpenScapes team that makes visible all of the work that goes into facilitation checklist timelines. So um, this is a slide from a, a talk that I have given that helps think about how to get started with documentation, if that's useful for folks. Um, the NASA OpenScapes Mentors is a example of one of these communities that we're working with. Um, this is a phenomenal community of folks who are user services support staff across the NASA Earth Science Data Centers. And they have, we've helped them come together as a community to support researchers as they migrate analytical workflows to the cloud. So they're creating a common set of tutorials. They're uh, creating a community of practice for teaching, mentoring and facilitation. And really this quote um, by Cassie Nichols, where she says, anyone I interact with, I want them to help, help them feel hopeful and valued and seen. I want to help people spiral up hope. So that's really this community that, um, is growing at NASA um, across the data centers. And they are supporting so many different aspects of uh, research on the cloud. They have developed cloud infrastructure and partnered with different groups to support um, users in Python, R, MATLAB, QGIS. 
Their cookbook is open documentation to support folks with code and mindsets around cloud. And the Earth Access Python library and cheat sheets and guides are both tech and conceptual aids to work on the cloud. One, uh, one um, other example here is, this is a slide from Dr. Margaret Seipel yesterday um, in the NOAA fisheries session, where they are thinking about how they've been changing, they've been bringing open science across their centers at NOAA fisheries. And they're thinking about this as a beautiful canopy that's visible. And there's, there's things around automated reports and collaborative project management that other people can see and appreciate and and like bask in the shade from and benefit from. And then that is founded by cross uh, center collaboration that are kind of the trunks and roots of these, of this forest um, and psychological safety um, is part of the foundation. And that's really enabled them to um, develop communication and collaboration and support different GitHub users and think about new avenues of collaboration for the public. Um, those, these are just a few stories. Um, what's really exciting is how these different groups are also able to learn from each other and share stories. So I've got a few links here that you're able to follow up and I'll put this, um, the direct link to these slides in, ch in chat in a moment. I'm sorry, I didn't do that. Um, but just to, to end, um, this is really about movement building and think about what's possible for all of this, for all of, from all of this. Um, we have more time for science and solutions. There's improved morale day to day for scientists who've been feeling stuck and are now connected with each other. Um, and really we're able to focus on climate and social change, which is where, um, where a lot of, what brings a lot of folks to this work as scientists and as researchers. And so really connecting those values to that daily work is really important. Um, I would, I'm, we're all in, inspired by learning from and joining from other movements. And these are a few um, examples, Taylor Swift, Issa Rae, Get Out the Vote, All We Can Save and Recoding America that, that are really inspiring us right now. And I'm particularly curious about the movement that Taylor Swift is building and the specificity in her storytelling that um, makes it big enough for everybody. So. Thank you so much. And I'm excited to um, hear the next talks. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Julia. So up next, we're going to have Rebecca from HDRL, GSFC, and NASA. And she's going to present on moving towards open science in heliophysics, the magnetopause open validation experiment. So with that, Rebecca, I'm going to get you to take it away. Great. Sharing the screen. There we go. All right, let's do this. So I'm here to talk about the magneto. Um, this is supposed to be magnetosphere. <laughs> I didn't change that. The magnetosphere open validation experiment. Um, this is a joint effort from the Heliophysics Digital Resource Library, uh, Center for Helioanalytics, uh, the John the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins, and uh, several other collaborators in the field. Um, so we're centered in heliophysics, which is a NASA name for stuff that's related to um, space weather, geophysics, aeronomy, and all those similar fields. So we're here to study what open science does for the physical sciences. Um, one, the common definitions that, that's been floating around in this, this conference is the U.S. definition from the White House. Uh, there are several other definitions from the entities internationally. So this word cloud uh, is what results when you put all of the major definitions into the word cloud technology. And the way a word cloud works is it will make uh, the words that occur the most often in the body of text to given appear bigger. Um, so um, based on this word cloud, we can come up with a general definition that based on all of these international definitions um, that open science is agreed upon that it's uh, making scientific knowledge and collaborations open. So how do we how do we do that? Well, if we focus on publications, uh, in this case for natural sciences and more specifically in heliophysics, space weather and related research, we can understand um, how open a publication is based on a couple of critical components, uh, whether the uh, data or software, hopefully both or included or not, um, and there's a range of 
how complete that inclusion is, whether the piece is used or cited or not. And there's a range like, do you at least include the citations in your literature? Usually we do that. But did you actually, did you include the citations for the software you used? Mm, we don't do that so well quite yet. And the third component I have uh, described here is related instructions, okay? Do you have instructions on what you actually did to run your code, what data set goes in here? Like those details that always screw us over when we try to use someone else's code, right? Um, and there's a scale on that. Um, we always include a method section because we're good scientists and we want the publication to be well regarded, right? Um, but we usually don't include the details. Um, like this file goes here and produces this piece here, you know, the pieces that someone would need if they were going to try to build on our work directly. And that ranges all the way open, all the way, sorry, all the way from fully closed, which is where we typically are on this side of the spectrum with our publications in the physical sciences, um, at least in my sector. <laughs> and then all the way up to completely executable, which uh, we have accomplished at least one time in, um, in our field. The purpose of the MOVE project is to try to increase the openness of our publications by interacting with the community um, to guide them along the research process. Because um, right now we currently can't validate or determine if a publication is believable um, because we're, all, we're sitting right over here with a typical publication. We want to study what it takes to increase that with the magnetosphere, sorry, I'll change that offline, uh, magnetosphere open validation experiment, not only by incorporating open science practices, but by incorporating modern uh, technology. Okay, so we want to determine what's difficult, what's easy, and what's critical for research to be open, transparent, and believable or validatable. Uh, we're working on linking technologies together to make this possible, especially for large data sets, data sets that are above that free zonodal limit. Uh, we want, we're building on previous efforts to develop uh, guidelines to simplify open research, particularly the NASA Open Science courses that are just, just came out in the last few months, and then a lot of the material in conferences like these. And we're looking to explore how open research can be done for a spectrum of privacy demands. Because not everyone is ready in our field to have their research open from the beginning. So we're linking technologies together to help make that easier. Um, because we expect from other people's research that if we make it at least easy to pull these pieces together and collaborate with other members of their team, that's a huge step in the right direction. So that's what we're focusing on. So our um, project, we've pulled all these pieces together. Um, the lines between the different entities indicate different, um, different actual links uh, between, say, our MOVE project page on the Open Science Framework, <coughs> excuse me, um, say GitHub pages that may or may not be linked, um, and then Helio Cloud, which is our cloud platform, which uh, I expect will be the next presentation. Okay, so the people on our OSF project page will be able to, and elsewhere, will be able to browse descriptions of data that we store in S3 buckets, currently approximately one petabyte of data for heliophysics and space weather. Um, they'll also be able to store their own large data sets on the cloud uh, and use them and share those data sets uh, through the cloud technology with their collaborators without any downloading of data. And uh, by doing their research on Helio Cloud based on this uh, Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Lab platform, it's already linked through the Git technology. And this is drop down menus, click a button. You can push and pull your software updates, whether you're improving the Move GitHub or the Helio Cloud um, technology on the GitHub or your own research uh, to your research specific GitHubs. And there's also, all, we're building easy access to instructions on our wiki on the OSF page, um, instructions for software on the GitHub, links to discussions on both GitHub and Helionauts, which is a Discord-based um, communication structure that is already taking communication in Helio Cloud by storm, um, pun intended. <laughs> okay, so the mirror board link is at the end. Um, our current status is that we have our science cloud platform on Helio Cloud is already sustaining over 100 users. Uh, this is not move. Uh, we're building on that cloud platform. 
Um, that cloud software is tested, stabilized, and it was released at the end of December. So you can cite the thing now, which is great. Um, there's a combination of pri privacy levels that are have been tested through the combinations of different platforms. And those uh, caveats and some surprises are going to be included on our introduction documentation. Um, um, those user guides are nearing a completed first draft. And right now we're looking for alpha testers. So we're looking for four to five, four to five, <laughs> not 45, four or five alpha testers to really uh, dig in and tell us where things are broken, where things are not broken, what's missing. Uh, in exchange for that detailed feedback, we're offering free cloud credits and user support to accelerate their research. Um, and we'll close here. So. The community in the natural sciences, and particularly what we see in heliophysics and space weather related research, is that there is a need for education and, and infrastructure to open and increase the transparency of the research in our field. Uh, we complement the TOPS curriculum by experimenting what te technology is needed to support the complex workflows, such as for model validation papers or um, AI and ML uh, publications, um, working with large data sets, people that want or comfortable sharing a little bit of what they're doing, but not the entire thing. Um, and we're looking to support an, an increased open culture and magnetospheric research. And the lessons that we learned from MOVE will be published openly, shared at conferences, uh, white papers, maybe even a peer reviewed publication, <laughs> and um, likely added to NASA open source science guidance. We are collaborating with them. Um, okay, contact uh, me by email or through the OSF webpage uh, to get involved. Um, and the QR code is right here. That's it for me. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So we have a couple of minutes before this session ends. I wanted to open up to see if there are any questions from our audience. And you can put that either in Q&A or you can just go ahead and unmute, unmute yourself. Rebecca. One comment I forgot to make is that from this group, it would be extremely useful for us to get feedback on our open science guidelines um, before they uh, become part of our user guide. So I'm going to put a link in the chat. And if people could go to that mirror board that would, and give us feedback on there, that would be extremely useful. I think that's a great idea. So if someone wants to be able to give feedback, what by what date should they provide that feedback? Oh, by the end of next week, I think. Uh, it should be a quick thing. All right, sounds fantastic. So got one minute left. Just take that minute to see if we have any questions from the audience. Sounds like no. So with that, I will close the session here in a minute. Thank you guys for joining. Really appreciate it. Round of applause for all of our speakers. That was incredible. And I will see you guys in future sessions. Thank you, everyone.